Hello and welcome to a special mock draft edition of the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Also give us a follow on Twitter at OTG Basketball. I'm your host, Nick Fay. With me today, two of our biggest draft heads on OTG, Mike Guido, Xavier Claiborne. What's up, guys? How are you doing today? What's up going on, Nick? It's a good day. It's a beautiful day to do some mock drafts. Yeah, we're, we're pretty excited. We had the lottery last night. You know, a tough night for me being a Nets fan, watching the Celtics get the number one pick, but not going to let that keep me down. Let's get right into this mock. We're going to lay this out just like the regular NBA draft. We're going to give you guys the pick. We're going to break down the pick, and then we're going to move on to the next one. Mike has all the odds. Xavier has all the evens. So let's get started with the number one pick in the NBA draft, the Boston Celtics select who? Uh, I'm going to go with Markel Fultz here. And the reason being is because, I mean, arguably he's the best player in the draft. I have Lonzo Ball as my number one player, but I think Fultz fits a little bit better. Ball is more of a, more of like a ball distributor, a guy, a guy that can run the offense. The Celtics really already have that. So if they can get a guy with an outrageous skill set, can score from the inside, uh, can stroke it from the outside and play hard-nosed defense in a guy like Markel Fultz, I think he could really take them to the next level and he should be able to start right from the get-go. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? Would you have gone with Fultz at number one? Yeah, right now for the for what the Celtics need, Fultz is the most ready product for that team. He's a guy that can play make, he can score, he can pass. We haven't seen him play a lot of defense in college, but I think that's going to change once he's surrounded by a Jay Crowder, Al Horford, and a Marcus Smart. I really like him as just a plug in, a plug and play kind of player for that team. And I think that um, with him. It could actually potentially lead to way into a trade for a superstar, but I think that'll be later down the road. Yeah, no, I like the Fultz pick here. Like you guys mentioned, this is a great fit for the Celtics. He can come in, give him something. And I think it's been, you know, uh, pretty pretty evident in the playoffs that they need that scoring, that second scoring option, that guy that can go out and get you, get you some points, make some plays. And I think Fultz could do that right away. So, Xavier, with the number one, number two pick, who do the Los Angeles Lakers select? Lazo Ball, the California kid. Magic Johnson's been screaming for this guy to become a Laker. His father has spoken into existence, and Lonzo Ball would be a LA Laker. On my draft needs, I see like the Lakers need a point guard and assets. With this pick, now all of a sudden Jordan Clarkson and D'Angelo Russell become expendable. I think that look towards my Magic Johnson to use them as trade bait to potentially get a Paul George or even a Jimmy Butler. But also Lonzo Ball just fits that LA market. He is the second coming of Magic Johnson, he can pass, distribute. He sees passes one. He sees passes before they happen, and I just think that he'd be a good fit in the LA market, especially with that 495 shoe he got. <laughs> Very true, Mike. What do you think about this pick? I, it's a perfect fit. It, it really is, and and you know I've been bragging about Lonzo Ball ever since I've been here at Off the Glass, and you know he's been my number one player from the start, and it's just simply because I don't even think he's the most skilled player in the draft. I just think that he's more of an impact player. He can bring a bigger change to a certain franchise. He fits the L.A. mold. I think he's going to jump right in, play point guard for them. They could move D'Angelo Russell over to the two guard, you know, emphasize his strengths with shooting the ball, you know, and get a little bit of extra passing in that firepower backcourt. I really like this Lonzo Ball pick. It's a perfect fit here in L.A. Yeah, LeVar's been and, calling for it. He's, he's asked for the Lakers to draft him, and then there's even been talk that the he, Lonzo Ball will only work out for the Lakers. So I like this pick. I think it fits. And like you mentioned, Xavier, this could lead to a possible trade of Clarkson or Russell in the future, and it gives them another asset moving forward. Also, just quick side note, look at the recent drafts where kids have gone back to their hometown. You have LeBron James. You have – um. Derrick Rose, usually these types of situations usually pan out well because the player's coming into an environment that they already know. He knows L.A., he knows California, so I think that that off-the-court standpoint is completely erased with this pick. Yeah, no, I agree with that, and, you know, it's always good to play for your hometown. It gives you that little extra edge. But with the number three pick, who do the Philadelphia 76ers select, Mike? Well, like I was saying before, I think the 76ers fell into the worst spot, and I genuinely think that it's – possible that they could trade out of this pick uh possibly trade back and get a couple of more assets but if they were to stay right here i just don't think he can pass on josh jackson I, you know he's the kind of player that you know a good two-way guy he's got a developing offensive game he's not all the way there yet um but defensively and in transition this guy's elite some of the best in the class you know more than likely they're going to let ben simmons run point so they're going to have an oversized lineup 
But again, with a talent like Josh Jackson on the board, I, I really don't think he could pass him up unless they trade back. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? This is our first disagreement of the day. I would like to see them pick De'Aaron Fox only because of this. De'Aaron Fox is a special kind of defender at the point guard position. Um, yeah, you're going to have Ben Simmons playing, running, quote-unquote, point, but you don't want him to have all the playmaking duties for that team. I think to bring in a De'Aaron Fox to kind of alleviate the playmaking abilities for Ben Simmons will allow Ben Simmons to also play off the ball sometimes. He is really good off the ball, backdoor cuts. can He can crash the glass as well. I like De'Aaron Fox for the Philadelphia Center Sixers because their point guard play has been atrocious the last couple of years. TJ McConnell, Chase and Rando. Like, we don't even know all the point guards that they had playing that position. I just think getting a nice, solid, defensive-minded De'Aaron Fox, who also has shown leadership qualities, would be a good pick. But I'm not mad that Josh Jackson pick as well. Just that if I was in the front office, I really value De'Aaron Fox, so I would select De'Aaron Fox. But for the sake of this draft, Josh Jackson's been picked. But I'm going with De'Aaron Fox if I had to. Yeah, I mean, I could see either guy in this situation. The guard need is definitely there. Like you mentioned, the point guard play has been bad. TJ McConnell has done as good as he can do. You know, he's not a starting point guard in the NBA. He's a solid player to have. The Fox situation, Mike made a great point where it's like they kind of fell to number three, which was the worst spot for them. You know, they, they kind of would prefer Lonzo Ball or Fultz. But I, I agree. I see a lot of upside in uh, Fox. You know, he might not be there at this exact moment, but I see a lot of potential in his game with that speed and athleticism that he does bring to the table. I, I, you know what? I, I, just to pile on top of that, I really like De'Aaron Fox, too. I'm not sure that he fits. I'm really not sure that he fits in Philadelphia because I think that with the the guards that they need, De'Aaron Fox is not really a very developed scorer, and it might take him a little bit of time to get there. Um, he, he, you know, he doesn't necessarily shoot the ball all that well. So if they were going to go with a guard, I, I mean, I've had Malik Monk going to this team for a long time. I just think it's too early to pick him, which is, you know, again, I, I don't love the fit with Josh Jackson, but I think since the value is there, I think you just, I think you got to go there if they. And I think out. some of this also depends on the Sixers and where they believe they're at you know, how far they're from the playoffs or if they don't mind waiting a, another year or two because they have a ton of young assets and we know going forward this is going to be a great team. But on to the number four pick, the Phoenix Suns. Who do you have for the Suns? I got the Phoenix Suns selecting Jason Tatum. I'm not in love with Jason Tatum at the four going to the Phoenix Suns where Mike had picked um, Josh Jackson. I really think that the Phoenix Suns is a perfect fit for Josh Jackson. But because he's off the board, Jason Tatum will be the next available player at the three spot. Um, I just think that right now, they really what Phoenix really needs is someone that's going to get Devin Booker the ball. They don't need someone that's going to take away shots from Devin Booker. But for this particular pick, they're going with the best overall player because they just want talent. They've already picked up Tyler, Tyler Ulis, and you've got Brandon Knight and Eric Blesso. Because realistically, Darren, De'Aaron Fox would be a good fit. But you already got too many point guards. So they go with a small forward with Jason Tatum. Just to plug in at the three spot, I'm not in love with this pick. I really am not. But from a talent standpoint, he is. He does have the most clean offensive package. You know, he has step backs. He has spin moves. You could post him up. He can do – he can even play a small ball four for this team. So I do like Jason Tatum from, from a talent standpoint. But I really like to see Josh Jackson go with this pick. But if they, if they had to choose – I'm going with Jason Tatum. Yeah, I think Phoenix is in a position where they can take best player available. They're early in that rebuilding stage. I don't think they'd have to worry about if there's a guard on the table they'd want to take. They would be willing to move Brandon Knight, and I think they'd be willing to even move Eric Bledsoe because they know that they're quite some time away from competing. But I think Tatum's a solid pick here. Do we see him as a three or a four moving into the NBA with the small ball changes that we see in the league? I think he'll be most effective at the four. He's not, he's athletic, but he's not uber athletic to play against some of these threes. But at the four, you can see him like how um, the New York Knicks use Carmelo Anthony. Him and Carmelo Anthony are the same height. Of course, you got to put in some muscle, but you can play him at the four. He can get away with it. There's not a lot of punishing fours in the NBA right now. So, you know, you could get away with him playing the four. And I think that would allow for a lot of more pace and space offense for that team. And, like I said, the idea for this team is you want to give Devin Booker the best chance to succeed because that's their star. I, I look at Jason Tatum more as a uh, more as a three. I mean, he comes in at 6'8", 205. 
Um, and his, his, his scoring ability is unreal. I, I, you know, he's a shot maker, which doesn't necessarily mean that he's an you know, over-the-top great shooter, but he knows how to get the ball in the basket. Um, I, don't, I don't have as much faith in Jason Tatum's body um, to body up against some of the bigger fours in the NBA. I think he would struggle there. I think he's got to get a little bit stronger. But I think he's versatile enough to play vo- uh, both four positions. Uh, I'm sorry, both forward positions. Um, but I think he suits best as a three. I think that's where his strengths lie. At number five, the Sacramento Kings. Who do you have, Mike? I, also, just to touch on the last pick, too, I do agree with Xavier a lot, though. I think Josh Jackson would be a perfect fit for that team. Um, but – the Sacramento Kings at number five, uh, this is where uh, I'm going to go with the Aaron Fox. And this is just, you know, pure with the fact that I think that when they have an opportunity to bolster up that backcourt, you know, they got Buddy Heald now. And I think Buddy Heald uh, blossoming in the NBA, I think he's going to blossom into a 20-plus point-per-game score. I really do. I love his upside. Um, and the Aaron Fox, again, he honestly kind of reminds me a little bit of Russell Westbrook with the way that he plays. He's very aggressive, not afraid to get in the paint, really hard-nosed defense. He's a good passer. If he can learn how to shoot it, De'Aaron Fox is going to be a serious player in this league. Yeah. So I really like him going to Sacramento here. The Kings owner definitely hopes Buddy Hill pans out. He definitely, I think he had really high hopes for him, saying he can be like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, and he was a big part of that trade of DeMarcus Cousins. With this pick, I like Fox. Like I mentioned before, I think he has plenty of upside, fits like a team like this that's early in that rebuild. Xavier, what do you think of this pick? I think that the Sacramento Kings have finally got out their own way. De'Aaron Fox falls into their lap. They don't mess this up because in recent drafts, they have just been atrocious. My only concern with it is you got to look at ownership and leadership. They are really a dysfunctional organization. The problem, I, the question I have is will they allow De'Aaron Fox to be that leader that he is? Will they allow him to control the offense, get guys where they're going, and will egos kind of settle in and allow him to be the leader? I'm, a, I'm really in love with De'Aaron Fox's game. I think defensively, he's the best defensive guard in this draft, easily. Well, he has a lead quick without question. Without question. Yeah, and uh, like you guys said, they do need some leadership in the Sacramento, so maybe bring in a few solid veterans who can kind of hold the show down, get, throw them some money, let them sit on the bench and keep things in stable, let these young players develop. But so we're, we're through the top five. Number one, Boston went with Markel Fultz. Number two, Lakers went with Lonzo Ball. Number three, Sixers went with Josh Jackson. Number four, the Suns went with Jason Tatum. And the Kings, at number five, went with De'Aaron Fox. So number six, Orlando Magic. Who do you have, Xavier? With number six, I think Orlando Magic take Malik Monk. Orlando Magic, they have one problem. They can't shoot the ball. And Malik Monk will come in right away and will, if anything, if he could do anything, he can't play defense. He's not really a good defender. He's not really a playmaker, but he can score and he can shoot. I watched them put a 40 against UNC where they literally just could not stop him at all. I think from a just pure scoring standpoint, he does have that almost J.R. Smith-like mentality of I'm going to keep shooting, keep shooting, keep shooting until I make it. Confidence will not be an issue with him. Question will be, will he be able to defend? But I think they have they have that kind of cover because you have Alfred Payton there. Aaron Gordon can defend. you got Bismack Bianco. Bismack Biombo. So defense really won't be an issue for them. They just need guys who can put the ball on the floor. Only other credible scorer they had last year was Evan Fournier. So I think they go with firepower and take Malik Monk. He is kind of short at 6'3-ish, 6'4", but I think he'll be able to adjust. Um, and I just like Malik Monk going to the Magic. They just need a shot maker. He's what he's exactly what that is, a shot maker. I think this is, you know, this fills the Magic's need. Like you said, offensively, they can use some pop. They have plenty of bigs. And, um, you know, they're going to have another pick later in the draft, too. So I, I think Malik F- Monk fits here. He mentioned last night that he thinks he has a little bit more playmaking ability than people think, especially in the pick and roll. So we'll see how that happens in the NBA. Mike, what did you think about this pick? Uh, I love it. I, I've loved Malik Monk from the beginning. I think he's a serious difference maker on the offensive side. Uh, he's right. He is a little undersized. He is a little bit weak on defense. Um, but I, I think he's got the serious potential to be able to take over a game when he needs to. Again, this is another guy in this draft that he honestly kind of reminds me of Lou Williams as well. Maybe a little more athletic version of Lou Williams. Just it could score it well, can really make um, really make a difference. I would put him right at the two guard and then and have Evan Fournier and Mario Hazonia kind of platoon themselves at that three spot. And then again, I you know I wrote this I wrote this yesterday. You know they've got some pretty good wings 
um, over there in Orlando. They're developing some good young talent. I really like your pick, Xavier. Really good. So yeah. the Magic are going to go with Malik Monk. So number seven, we have the Minnesota Timberwolves. They've been in the lottery a ton of late. Who do you have them picking at number seven, Mike? Uh, you'll let them fall right into my lap. Um, I, this just, this pick makes too much sense. I'm going to go with Jonathan Isaac out of Florida State. Absolutely. Um, th- this kid, uh, I think he fits best as a four instead of a three. I think he's big for a four, and he's not quick enough to play a three. Um, but he fits right in between Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns, right off the pick and roll. He can stretch the floor a little bit, can score on the inside, and he's a tenacious rebounder. When his body gets a little bit bigger, I think you could see Jonathan Isaac is possibly one of the top three or four best players coming out of this draft long term. I love this kid. Yeah, this pick makes sense here too. Phil's in that four position. I've heard things about uh, Jonathan Isaac that people have mentioned that he could possibly end up being the best player in the entire draft. So what do you guys think about that? I honestly can agree with that 100%. He already has guard skills at the four position. I've already seen enough of him in Florida State to know that. he And he wants to be good as well. He wants to be coached. At Florida State, he really was not a shot taker. He was a shot maker. He was not a volume scorer. He took whatever the team, whatever the defensive team allowed him to do. He wasn't out there shot hunting. He wasn't out there um, just doing whatever. He's a very smart and very – coachable kid. A lot of reports come out of Florida State and ultimately he's in high school is that you can coach him up. He can be coached. Also at the fourth spot with long arms and defensively, he can go out and guard um, guards, point guards, wings, and forwards. So I really like his versatility and what he could possibly become. Yeah, you know Tibbs will make the most out of him defensively. But at number eight, if I'm not mistaken, both of you guys are New York Knicks fans. So at number eight, who do the Knicks select, Xavier? Uh, this is this is tough. They need a point guard. So it's between Dennis Smith and Frank Nekakina from France. I'm going to go with Dennis Smith. I think Dennis Smith, from an athletic standpoint, the, the Knicks' problems the last couple of years is at the point guard position. They've just been out, outclassed. We had Jose Calderon who killed and guard a door. We've had, <laughs> we've had, you know, we even had Sasha Vujicic run the point. I just think that this gives us an athletic point guard that could finally match up with the other point guards in the league and he can pass, questions about his coachability and defense. And I I fear the atmosphere of Phil Jackson and this whole dysfunctional situation at the Knicks being to his detriment. But I really like his talent from just a raw talent standpoint. He has John Wall athleticism, and he's also pretty a pretty decent size at 6'3". And I've seen enough of him that I very I love Dennis Smith. I would like to see him – I would like to see him play better in college. But from a pure pro standpoint, he can play pick and roll. He can he can match up physically with these point guards. I think that's what the Knicks need. Yeah, it kind of gives the, the Knicks somebody to grow with Porzingis. You know, that point guard combo. Like you mentioned, the Knicks really haven't had a great point guard the last few seasons, defensively and offensively. You know, they haven't had somebody who's able to really run the show. Mike, what do you think about this pick? Uh, this is this is the pick that I disagree with you on. Um, I, honestly, I agree with the needed point guard. I would have gone with Frank Tilakina. Um, but listen, Dennis Smith has all the skills. The one thing that I don't like about Dennis Smith is that he's way too passive. He's way too, he's not, you know, willing to take a big shot. He's not willing to take over an offense. You know, I think he's a little bit too passive and especially on a team like NC state where the talent was really kind of minimal. I really think Dennis Smith should have shown a little bit more aggressiveness, but the skills are there. I'm just not sure of the fit in New York. My rebuttal to you is that with Frank, He's he's a point guard by position, but watching some of his work on just watching some tape that I am able to watch, he's not really he's not really a confident ball handler. His jump his jump shot is suspect. He can defend. He's a better defender than Dennis Smith, but I just think that um Dennis Smith has too much talent to pass up for a guy out of France that we haven't really seen a lot of. I I respect that. I respect that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. The Knicks have taken the you know the chance on the international guy, and that worked out really well with Chris Tapps Porzingis. But on to number nine, the Dallas Mavericks. Who do they select, Mike? Yeah, it's it's torn between two guys, and I think uh, Xavier would know the two guys I'm talking about. It's between Laurie Markin and and now since Tilakina's on the board, I'm gonna uh, Tilakina as well. Uh, this is actually kind of tough. I'm going to go with Frank Tilakina here, and the reason being is because is because I I'm not sure how 
um, how long Yogi Ferrell is going to is going to hold up there. I think he suits best as like an energy guy off the bench. What I've seen from Frank Tillichino, I, I love this kid a lot more than a lot of people do. You know, and people can call me crazy all they want, but this kid's got legitimate skills. Um, it, Xavier's right. He's not as confident as he is as a ball handler, but that's because his handles really aren't that good. You know, it, it doesn't mean he turns the ball over, but, you know, his, his handles are not that great. But he lights the ball up from three-point range. He shot over 40% from the Euro League. Uh, and the kid's only 18 years old, so the upside is all there. Again, he's a big point guard, get, distributes with the offense well, good defender. Uh, I really like Tilakina. We're going to see how good he is coming over uh, from overseas, but in a, in a system like Dallas where the market really is not as big as in L.A. or a Boston or a New York, I think he's going to have the time to develop. And they're in a position where they're going to need to rebuild a little bit after Dirk Nowitzki. So I, I like the fit here with Tilakina. There has been a lot of reports that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mavs have been interested in Tilakina. So I definitely could see this pick happening. Xavier, what do you think about this? Do you think this makes sense? I, I kind of agree with the fact that Yogi Ferrell is probably not a starter in this league. I agree with that, but I, I like Laurie Marketing, man. This is the heir pen of Dirk Nowinski. You know, this is a deep draft where I think you can get a competent point guard to, you know, kind of get you – to where you want to be, but when you have a guy like Marketing who's a seven footer with le with legitimate um ball handling skills, I don't think you pass up on that. You know, it's harder. You could find a point guard. You know, this is a point guard league. This is a point like we're in the age of the point guard. I feel like you could always get a point guard, especially at number nine. Um, I would just go with Marketing. I, I mean, too much of them to just be like, oh, let's just pass up on him. Yogi Ferrell will do enough because listen, they're not competing for a championship anytime soon. Right now, they just want to get talent and get younger. Marketing would be the answer for me. All right, at number 10, who do you have the Sacramento Kings selecting, Xavier? Once again, the Sacramento Kings have a player fall into their lap, and they get Laurie Markkinen, and now they have their point guard and forward of the future. I just really love Laurie Markkinen's ball skills. Um, defense is not too much of a worry for me right now for Sacramento because, like I said, um, they're not really competing for a playoff spot or or even a championship. So Laurie Markkinen would be the pick for me. Him Pairing him up with... De'Aaron Fox, especially with him being a pick and pop threat, would open the lane so much more for, for De'Aaron Fox. So I really like Laurie Marketing going to the Kings at number 10. So could you guys tell me a little bit about Marketing's game? What what could you expect in his rookie year? What do you kind of expect him to grow into? He's an immediate impact guy. This, this guy is a really good pick. And I honestly think that he falls uh, – you're right. He falls right into the Kings' lap. Um, he's a spitting image of Pau Gasol, and Xavier probably thinks the same thing. Again, good rebounder, great size, and he can pick and pop from all over the floor. Again, and they don't necessarily need another rim protector. You know, they've got two big guys down yep. there in Sacramento when Willie Cauley-Stein and George Papianis. So, they, you know, they don't need really too many rim protectors there. They need a scorer from down low. You know, so they, if they feel comfortable with Perrin Laurie Markkinen and Scalabissier and maybe the same lineup and give themselves a truly firepowered offense, then go for it. I love this kid. I really do. It sounds like the Kings could have a great draft, which hasn't been the case the last three seasons. So maybe they'll finally do something right this year. But on the show. Go ahead, they, will only, they will only have a good draft because players are literally falling into their lap. Like these are no-brainer kind of picks that they that they have because of what everyone else is doing. To be honest with you, but let's be honest, the Kings have had no-brainer type situations in the past, and they've completely messed those <laughs> up. So you're absolutely right. Absolutely so we'll right. have to just wait and see on that. Number eleven, Charlotte Hornets. Who do you have them grabbing, Mike? Uh, you know, a lot of people would say uh, to go with Zach Collins here out of Gonzaga, but I'm going to go Justin Patton out of Creighton. I, I just like this kid's all-around game a little bit more. I think he could jump in right away and start. Again, and this is the Hornets' biggest need. They really just need a true NBA center. Um, you know, that's the one thing they've been lacking. You know, they've got their point guard in Kemba Walker. They've got a, gun, a bunch of good wings like Nick Batum and Michael Kidd-Gilchrist and, you know, guys of, uh, guys of that nature. I know they drafted Frank Kaminsky a year ago, but he's not really a center. He's more of a guy that can stretch the floor and, you know, run your offense a little bit like that. They need a true NBA center that can protect the rim, rebound, and, again, put his back to the basket. I like Justin Patton, and he's got the ability to win. He carried Creighton on his back this year, so he's proven that he can win at a high level as well. Well, you mentioned the need for center. You know, Frank isn't a true center, and when Zeller went out last season, they definitely struggled. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? Um, I disagree with you on this one. I've seen Justin Patton play in person, 
And just 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 to be honest, his body is not NBA ready at all. He was getting pushed around by forwards in college. So I would go more along the lines of Zach Collins because Zach Collins is more NBA ready than Justin Patton. But I'm not mad at the pick because Justin Patton does have a lot of potential. He's a mobile big that just flies up and down the floor. But if it was just me, I would go with Zach Collins. But I'm not mad. But if you're getting Justin Patton, just know that, that is, that's what we call a project. He is a project because his ball skills aren't really there yet either. So you have no ball skills and not an NBA ready body. So I think with, they're taking him knowing that they're going to need to develop him. But I would go with Zach Collins. But I'm not mad to pick neither. Justin Pan's a good player. I'm not mad at it. I'll just go with Zach Collins in this position. I, the Hornets may be able to afford to, you know, work with him a little bit. Like you said, he's a raw. He needs some work on his game. They do have Zeller starting. I mean, I don't see them competing for a championship anytime soon. They still are a few, few pieces away. So we'll see what happens there. Number 12, Detroit Pistons. Who do you have them grabbing, Xavier? Oh, for the Detroit Pistons on my team needs, I know that they need – three-point shooting, and talent at the three. So I'm going to go with Justin Jackson out of UNC. I just think that this is a good pro-ready pro ready fit for this kind of team. He's long. He can play the three. He can shoot the three ball. He can defend. He's just a small overall IQ basketball player. Stan Van Gundy likes guys that are going to give effort and give energy because he'll, he'll let you know if, you, if they're not playing well. I just think that he really fits well with this team. They really just need um, three-point shooting. Also, I'll, I'll kind of look at – I put them too. Where you know we're not really sure what they're trying to do with Reggie Jackson, but at number twelve, there's not really a point guard that you would take at number twelve, since all the good point guards are pretty much taken off. So I think they go down and settle for Justin Jackson. I just think he's a nice, solid, safe pick at number twelve. Yeah, and I'm not mistaken, Justin Jackson, somebody who stayed in college, kind of worked on his game, and it's, it paid off. No, he's he's developed over the years. He's he's really improved his game over the uh, over the course of his four year career at UNC. Um, and you know what? It, the one thing, and you know Xavier knows this as well. I mean, when he came into UNC, he couldn't shoot it at all. And he, you know, all of a sudden he's coming out with this big three point game as a senior. So I I really like Justin Jackson here. They definitely need three point shooting, especially with Contavious Caldwell Pope uh, going to be a free agent. He's probably going to come at a high price tag. Um, I like the pick. I, I'm surprised that you didn't go Zach Collins, though. I'm really surprised you didn't go Zach Collins. See, only reason why I didn't go with Zach Collins is because I just for for this team, you, you still have you still have Marcus Morris. You got some power forwards that you're gonna, you know, and you also you still have um my man from last year that they picked up. Oh, what's his name? Henry Ellison. Yeah, Henry Ellis Henry Ellison. Give him some run. Give him some run. Let him develop, you know. So, John Lear has played some good minutes for them as well. A pick up in the free agency. You know, he's a solid stretch the floor type four. Yeah, I just like I just really like Justin Jackson for this kind of team. You know, this is a team that wants to make it to the playoffs, and they don't really have time for a guy that they need to develop. You know, you can just put Justin Jackson right in there. He's a pro ready guy. You know, he's a guy that's going to play a role. But Stanley Johnson hasn't really panned out for them, so I would go with just Justin Jackson. I just like I just he's a smart. He's a UNC guy. He's a four year guy. You know. He's been there. He's done that. I think he's just ready to contribute to an NBA team. You mentioned Stanley Johnson. That's an interesting point because Stanley Johnson, his rookie season, he came, he went in the summer league and he just destroyed everything. He had a pretty good rookie season. Then last year, he really didn't do much. So that's an interesting point to keep an eye on. But at number 13, who do you have the Denver Nuggets taking, Mike? This is really this is a really tough pick to make because I was expecting Justin Jackson to fall here. Um, but... <sighs> See, I don't want. I, I know Zach Collins is really the value pick here, but you know they got Nikola Jokic and they got Mason Plumlee, so you know they, I'm they're not going to go big. Uh, I, I might go with a wild card pick here. I'm going to go with Terrence Ferguson, and I, the reason being is because you know I think they need more athletes. I really do. Terrence Ferguson is an, uh, Terrence Ferguson is as athletic uh, as they come, you know, in this draft. He can shoot it a little bit. Again, he's another project, um, but I think he he reminds me a lot of Terrence Ross. So you know, if they can get that kind of production at, uh, out of him at, out of a thir uh, number thirteen pick, the, the Nuggets I think would be fine. You know, and they're not really weak at the wing either. Gary Harris is coming along. You know, they're they're going to be all right. But uh, I'm going to go Terrence Ferguson here. The Nuggets can't afford to take a risk. You know, they do have the assets. They have these young players ascending. And Terrence Ferguson, if I'm not mistaken, is that the player that didn't play in college and he played overseas? Correct. So how do you think that will impact him going to the NBA? Will that be a benefit or a negative? 
I think he's been playing with grown men, so I think it'll be a benefit. And traditionally, we've seen guys go overseas like Brennan. Only two other guys we have is Brennan Jennings and Emmanuel Moutier. And returns have shown that it doesn't hinder it. It doesn't, it doesn't help them greatly, but it doesn't hinder him. I just think that he's at a good place because they're used to the pro lifestyle, used to games, back-to-backs and whatnot. I think it's more of a – I think it'll help him more than it hurt him. Yeah, and, you know, they make money, which is great for them because, you know, they don't get paid in college and there's always that chance of injury. So, I mean, I never really hate on guys for going overseas. Personally, like, I'm surprised that more guys don't do it, actually, just for the sense that they can make a lot of money and help their families out. So, but I I wouldn't be surprised if we see that more going forward. But number 14, the Miami Heat, who are they grabbing, Xavier? This is where they take Zach Collins. They have a hole at the power forward. And I think Zach Collins is perfect for a power forward. You have a defensive-minded center next to him and Hassan Whiteside. Um, I've kind of, you know, he might, might, they might look at John Collins at this position as well, at this pick as well. But I, I think if Zach Collins falls to them at number 14, I really like um, Zach Collins to, uh, as a fit. He could, he could stretch the floor. He can shoot a little bit. He has post moves, and he's an offensive-minded player playing along a defensive-minded player in Hassan Whiteside. So I just like the fit of Zach Collins going to the Miami Heat. Mike, what do you think about this pick? Uh, I love it. I mean, again, this is another one of their uh, those fall-into-your-pick, uh, uh, fall-into-your-lap picks. Um, I see Zach Collins a little bit more as a center than a power forward, but he's definitely got the versatility to do both. Um it, This is another guy, again, he's developed as a rim protector and a defender, but he's got to get better on the offensive end. You know, I I don't necessarily love the pick, uh, love the fit with the Heat, but I really like the pick. I think, you know, at number 14, you get a good player like Zach Collins. You can't argue that. That's that's a good pick. Eric Spolch is a great coach. They do a great job with player development. They've turned a ton of guys that have kind of been, you know, high risk, high reward type players and the great players this season. So it'll be nice to see the Heat next year and see how they do. Number 15, who do the Portland Trail Blazers grab, Mike? Uh, this is where I'm going to go John Collins. And this is just because, again, he's a good athlete, good finisher at the rim. Um, you know what? And this is one of those players that I really wasn't sure about. Uh, coming into uh, coming into this season because I really I didn't see much that I was impressed with you know he's kind of undersized you know it, but we'll see again he's a good athlete can score a little bit um, and that, that I think the Blazers kind of need that kind of guy down low you know they got Yusuf Nurkic and he's you know panning out really well for them you know they need a guy that can step in front of Noah Vonleh a little bit so I, I like John Collins here. Yeah, they could definitely use some upgrades in that front court out of the Nurkic, like you mentioned. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? I like it. They just need overall talent at the three and four spots. You know, you've been running Mo Harkless and Evan Turner and Noah Bonley. They just need upgrade at those two positions. So I'm okay with that pick. That's a, that's not a that's a, that's a good pick. They just need talent because they've been rolling out mediocre NBA players at those two positions. Poor poor CJ McCullum and Damian Lillard coming out knowing that you started with Mo Harkless and Noah Bonley. I mean. They need more talent. They just need talent at those two positions. So I'm okay yeah. with it. They definitely need that upgrade in the front court. Like you mentioned, Dame Lillard and CJ McCollum, one of the best backcourts in the league. They need some help down low. Number 16, who do you have the Chicago Bulls taking? The Chicago Bulls with the 16th pick take Luke Kennard. I just think that he feels need at the two spot and three wow. push. Uh Yeah, I, I know. But to be honest, like with a team like that, he don't really have to – he won't have to create his own shot because the ball – from all intents and purposes, it looks like that they are going to keep Ray John Rondo and keep Jimmy Butler. We don't know what Dwayne Wade is going to do, so I think you take Luke Kennard, who's a specialist. He's a three-point shooter, and he's a, underrated, a very underrated scorer. Watching him at Duke, there were times where he was pretty much unguardable on the field. And I just think that he feels a need for a three-point shooting and a two-guard. I just think he feels a need. I, you, you're saying wow, but I, I really like I like Luke Kennard's game. I really do. I think he's just a solid player at six six. He's an underrated defender as well. He's a what we call a positional defender. You know, he's a guy that just be in the right position to defend. He's not an on ball stopper, but if there's a weak side rotation, he'll find a way to get there and be a force. So I like Luke Kennard here at number sixteen. And I think a lot of people have talked about Luke Kennard. One thing for him is he's constantly improved his game from when he started at Duke. So I think that's something to look forward to. And the Bulls do need do need shooting. But, Mike, what do you think about this pick? You did say, wow, so let's hear your thoughts. 
No, no, honestly, I, I was I was shocked by the pick, but I really don't hate it. I, honestly, I that wasn't really a bad wow. It was um, it was more of a shocking wow. But um, I, I like Luke Kennard. I think he can definitely score at the NBA level. He's uh, unbelievable at just finding ways to get the ball in the basket. You know, he makes some pretty crazy shots. He's, you know, really good at making shots, falling on his back. So, I, you know, I like Luke Kennard here. I don't think it's their biggest need. Um, I probably, if I had the pick, I honestly maybe would have gone Jared Allen. Um, but it, I, cause I think they need a little bit more big guys, but it, I don't hate the pick. I'm not mad at it. Not at all. I'll, so on, on the big man step, they have a lot of big men that they have to just start throwing out like Bobby Portis. You still have Robin Lopez. You got Felicio. Who's a very, I just think big men, big men, wise, I feel like that they are set. They just have to let those guys play a lot more minutes. So that's why I said Luke Kennard, because they have talent at those positions. I just think that they're going to have to come to a point where they have to just decide to play these guys. Well, I think it's both the Bulls have to decide what they want to do. Do they want to compete for the playoffs? Do they want to enter this rebuild, trade Jimmy Butler, get these young players, build up their assets, and move forward? So it'll be an interesting offseason for the Bulls. Moving on to pick number 17, the Milwaukee Bucks. Where do you have them grabbing, Mike? Uh, this is where my number one center comes off the board, and everybody knows that this is pretty crazy, but I'm going to take Bam on a bio. And, I, again, I think he just fits so perfectly um, into this system. It gives them identity. It really does. You know, they can let Giannis Antetokounmpo run his offense. It'll allow Jabari Parker to play to his strengths, move down a spot into the lineup, um, let him play more of a three. And then again, they've got a nice young front court that they've got going on there with Thon Maker and now with Bam Adebayo. I, again, a guy that can score from the basket. He's developmental with his uh, with his uh, rebounding and his um, his shot blocking. I, I really like this kid. I don't think uh, a lot of the NBA guys are giving him enough credit. He reminds me a lot of Dwight Howard. So I, I'm, I like Bam out of bio here. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? I actually like that pick because he needs to go to a team where he's going to be set up for easy baskets. He doesn't need to be the primary. Or he just needs to be able to go out there, rebound, block shots, and just be able to get drop-offs. And I actually like this pick because – who else they have at the four? Thon Maker. I think he's better than Thon Maker personally because I just think that the potential is there. He has a jump shot that he just did not show at Kentucky. I watched him in high school, and I've seen a little bit of it in Kentucky, but he, he can shoot a little bit. But just from a physical standpoint, that's a very physical matchup at that four spot, especially with a lot of people wanting to go small ball four. I think that gives them a nice little tool to have to match up with these other teams because trying to box out, Trying to box out Jabari Parker, Bam, Abid Bam Abidal, Giannis Antetokounmpo. That's a lot of size and length out there to try to compete with. So I think they're just going to go all in on just trying to be as big and athletic team as possible because Bam is a big that can that also can run and can move his feet. So I actually really like this. Pick. Yeah, really and nice. I mean, it kind of adds, like you mentioned, the physical. They're trying to have that physical advantage, and that would be adding to that physical advantage they would have. But at number 18, who do you have the Indiana Pacers grabbing? At 18, the Indiana Pacers take TJ Leaf. I just I think when you have Miles Turner in there trying to develop a post game, I think TJ Leaf just fits from a stretch four mentality. On there, I really have a PG replacement, but there's no PG replacement in this draft. So the next thing I went with is stretch four. If P if Paul George leaves, they really don't have an identity, but I just need to just take overall talent at the stretch four. Because Thaddeus Young, although he's he's been in this league a long time, I think it's time for him to just accept the role coming off the bench and allow TJ Leaf to be great. TJ Leaf has shown a lot of skill. He's more athletic than what people give him credit for, and he's a very very, very like him at this at this spot. I could imagine him running pick and roll with Jeff T and or if Jeff T comes back, because Jeff T's a free agent this year as well. But I really like TJ Leaf as a stretch forward for this team, just to plug in and allow him to grow with Miles Turner. And they really, and they could, really use could use another stretch, stretch four on this team. team so, so this pick does make sense. Mike, what do you think about it? I I, I really like it. I, you know, I actually, in, in my mock, I had TJ Leaf uh, going a little bit earlier. And I think this is a really, really good pick. You know, their biggest need, honestly, I think, is just they, they need more bodies down low. You know, yeah. they need more depth to run. You know, LaVoy Allen really isn't cutting it down there. 
So, you know, if they can get some guys that can run the floor, can face up and score on the inside, then I really like the pick. TJ Leaf can definitely do that. And you're right. He's more athletic than we give him credit for. This is a really solid pick, but I'm not sure he falls this far. But if he falls this far, this is a great pick by the Pacers. Number 19, Atlanta Hawks. Who do you have him grabbing? I'm actually surprised that this guy felt uh, this low, too. I'm going to go with Donovan Mitchell out of Louisville. Um, and the reason being is because this is one of those teams that I can't really nail down. And it's just because, you know, they've got so many guys that you can plug in so many different holes. You know, Tim Hardaway Jr. is a free agent, but uh, – you know, but they still got Tabo Cephalosha. They still got Ken Bazemore. But those guys are more role players to me. So, again, if they can get Donovan Mitchell, who could potentially jump into kind of like maybe even like an Avery Bradley role like they have with the Celtics, and Dennis Schroeder and Donovan Mitchell can kind of run that floor like that, I think it's a perfect fit. He's a good two-way player, really developed his offensive game. He is undersized. He's only 6'2". But, again, he's very quick, tenacious on defense, I like the fit. I do. Yeah, Donovan Mitchell's been somebody who's relatively high on some draft boards, you know, top 15, so this would be a great value pick for the Hawks. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? Uh, I'm, I'm not in love with Donovan Mitchell. Only because <laughs> he's really undersized. Like, he's severely undersized for a two-guard, even smaller than Malik Monk. But – for the Atlanta Hawks, they just need players. You know, I think um, they Mike need scoring. They, they need scoring. Yeah, Mike Budenholzer does a good job of coaching up guys. So I'm if he had to go to a place, Atlanta's a good place where they won't they'll count on him, but he won't be needed day to day. So I like I like that. He could like probably give him there. a nice spark plug off the bench, possibly see how he does his rookie season. Who do you have the Blazers taking at number twenty, Xavier? I got the Blazers taking OG Anobi out of Indiana. He's coming off the injury, but they need someone that can actually play some defense. You know, they've been a walking turnstile the last couple of years, and I think he feels a need because he can play small forward and power forward at 6'8", 215, with long. He's really long with a 7'2", inch wingspan. So I really like the fit for them just to get a defender at that position because a lot of times when they go up against guys with small forwards, they get killed. So I think yeah. OG Anobi is a good guy to come in, play some defense, play some spot minutes and he's also worked on his three-point shot you know his three-point shot is it it's not as bad as it was and, he, and he's shown the, the ability to improve it so I really like the pick you know a lot of people compare him to Kawhi Leonard I don't think he's there but I also just like the fit of him being able to play some defense because he needs some somebody in there that can play some defense he yeah someone that can cover these guys because Damian Lillard and CJ come on a small backcourt and is he someone that could help just help play some defense so I like him going to the Blazers when Alfred Gramino went out last year, they literally had no solid defenders and they were just getting eaten alive like you'd mentioned. Mike, what do you think about this pick? Perfect. Absolutely love it. it, it uh, the, you could not have made a better, better pick, Xavier. I, I seriously mean that. Um, this kid is just so good defensively. I honestly think he's one of the better defensive players in this draft. I would even say it's possible that from a forward standpoint, behind Josh Jackson, he might be the next best guy. And I, and I mean that in all, in all seriousness. He's a good athlete, plays really aggressive. I love the pick. Love it. Thank you. That really, that really makes me smile right now. <laughs> there we go. We got some agreement. Not all disagreement on the draft show. Uh, number 21, OKC. Who's going to come and help Russell Westbrook? Uh, this is such a hard pick to make. Uh, they need scoring in the worst way, but – all the scores are gone, so <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see where we go. I'm actually gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go a guy from overseas. I'm gonna go with Rodion's Karuch, and uh, reason being is because I, I think Lord only knows when he's gonna come over. But th this kid reminds me so much of Gordon Hayward, and he does a lot of things right. Again, six eight, two hundred pounds. He's got to fill up a little bit but he can definitely shoot it. He's a good athlete, can finish at the rim, needs a little help on defense. But I really like Rodion's Karuch as an overseas prospect. Again, it, with all the scores being off the board, I think this is kind of the road that they have to go down. But I, I like Karuch as a player a lot. I think he fits well. Xavier, what do you think about this? I, I like it. You know, he's a good fit. Um, they just need they – need, they, they just need help. You know, they've been exposed, and they got exposed in the playoffs. They Russell Westbrook has no help. So if you want to take a chance on a guy from overseas, I say go for it. You're going to be in the playoffs next year anyway. 
So I like the pick. I really, I'm. He's a good play. I like him. That's that's not bad at six eight. You know, that's you know, they need some. They need some length too. You know, also help probably help on the rebounding boards as well. So I like it. I like this pick. It'll be interesting to see. Like Mike mentioned, he could stay overseas if OKC is looking for more instant help, or they're just going to focus on that in the off season. They don't mind taking a risk of the draft pick. But number two, 22, my Brooklyn Nets. Who are they grabbing, Xavier? The Nets get a guy that's coming off an injury but was billed at the beginning of the season as being the number one pick, Harry Giles. This is a Bang, woman. <laughs> this is a great woman. <laughs> this is a great pick for them. You know, they they just need talent. They need talent. It don't matter where this talent comes from. It could come from the D League, from overseas. It don't matter. So they take a chance on Harry Giles. They ain't going nowhere fast. He's coming off of in, he come off of knee injuries, but all for, from all the reports saying that he's absolutely healthy. So I think they take a chance. They go with the guy that was supposed to be the number one pick in this draft, and they go with Harry Giles out of Duke. Yeah, this has been a player that's been linked to the Nets. You've mentioned it. He had high aspirations going to this college season. It hasn't worked out that way. Me and Mike talked a little bit about him last week, and. You know, I wouldn't mind this at all. He definitely has the potential. It's a project, like you said, the Nets aren't going to compete with a championship anytime soon. So I'm cool with this. Mike, what do you think about this? I heard you shouting in the background. <laughs> uh, it, again, another perfect pick. You know, they need, they're at a point right now, you know, they don't have the number one pick. That's shipped over to Boston. So this late in the first round, I know they got two picks, but this late in the first round, they got to gamble on upside. They have to. Harry Giles, I mean, he really didn't produce in college, really didn't produce. Uh, but the upside, again, is still there. I mean, he was the number one recruit in the nation coming out of high school. So, again, gamble on the upside. I think he could still be a pretty good player. He's just got to put it all together. I love the pick here. It, perfect fit for the Brooklyn Nets. What do we see as his ceiling? You know, what, like, you know, where can he develop? Where is he going to do his thing in the NBA? What type of player is he going to be like? I, I think, you know, um, you can see an Amari Stoudemire type, but um, Amari Stoudemire from the New York Knicks, you know, the guy that could shoot the jump shot, that could post up, you know, he's not as athletic as Amari Stoudemire is, but he, I kind of, you kind of see a spitting image of Amari Stoudemire, you know, a guy that's going to develop his skills, be an all around offensive player. He can rebound with the best of them. I just, I really like, I really like his game. And I really like him going to the Nets where he'll have plenty of time. They ain't going nowhere fast. He got plenty of time to develop. Yeah, and if I could just touch on that, too, I think he's exactly right with the Amari Stoudemire comparison. But I'm even going to go maybe even a step higher. I think this kid's upside is upwards of Anthony Davis. I really do. I mean, he's got a really similar skill set. And, uh, you know, again, it, it's a long shot to the point where he gets there. But, you know, a couple of years down the road, you know, you could be looking at a seriously good value pick here for the Nets. Well, God bless, and hopefully the Nets get lucky here. They definitely could use some luck. Number <laughs> number 23, who would we have the Toronto Raptors grabbing? You know, I've had Ivan Rabb tied to this team for a long time, but I'm gonna, I, I'm surprised he's still on the board. I'm going to go with Isaiah Hartenstein out of Germany. Uh, the, the kid is just too good of a player. He does a lot of things right. I, I'll tell you what, I mean, we talked about Laurie Markkinen and how he was – the heir to, uh, to Dirk Nowitzki before, uh, if he gets picked by Dallas. But uh, he, Isaiah Hartenstein, I think, reminds me a little bit more because I think he's a better shooter. I do. I think he stretches the floor a little bit more. He's way more athletic, um, good shot blocker. He got, he's not polished by any means necessary. He's a bit of a project. But, again, it, with Patrick Patterson going into free agency and possibly getting signed to a decent amount of money, I think this is a pretty good pick here for the Toronto Raptors. Yeah, the Raptors definitely need to add some talent to that team. They struggled this postseason. It's going to be an interesting offseason for them as well. Xavier, how do you feel about this pick? Only reason why he's fallen so down low is because he, there's really some character issue flaws that he has. You know, me being a kid from Queens, I heard about him from overseas. You know, how he, he's yelling at people. He has a cocky attitude. I just think if he can get his attitude in order, I mean, he wasn't really even impressive at the Nike Hoop Summit. He was not impressive at all. But um, from what I saw just off of highlight tapes and film and whatnot, he's actually a nice a nice little fit for Toronto. They need talent at that four position. You know, Patrick Patrick is not getting the job done. He's really not. So I think they take a chance. Go with Isaiah. If anything, we all know that um, Coach Dwayne Casey don't play that, that, that nonsense anyway. So I think that they'll get him under wraps. And I like the pick. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Dwayne Casey's still the coach entering next season. There's been a lot of talk about the Raptors possibly making a change. But on to number 24, the Utah Jazz. Who do you have them grabbing, Xavier? Tough pick because I got a couple of guys that they could take. Because when you're a playoff team, you just want talent and depth. Well, during the during the playoffs, they got exposed by not having a backup point guard. And I, this may be a shocker, but I really like this kid's game, and the potential is there. I'm going with Edmund Sumner at Xavier. Wow. I'm going – I know something. this sounds like a reach, but towards the end of the first round, I really like his game. He's a 6'9 point guard. I mean, my fault, not 6'9, 6'5 point guard that can defend. And I think that he fits into that mold of them and being may need a backup point guard. I had Jawan Evans here, but I just think that, you know, there's a four-inch difference. And the wingspans, this, this this is more of a potential pick. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they went with a Jawan Edmonds or even a Semi Ojale out of SMU. But I think Edmonds Sumner's there. They can afford to take a chance because I think regardless of whatever happens, next year they'll be in the playoffs. I'm just going to go with Edmonds Sumner. You know, he's ranked really low. But I just think that he has first-round talent. And I'm, I'm going to go with Edmonds Sumner. So, Mike, what do you think about this pick for the Jazz at number 24? I, I'll tell you what, I just, I, I don't love the fit because, again, I, I think they already have their big point guard. I think, you know, Dante Exum kind of fits that mold. Um, I do think that it's a bit of a reach. I don't hate the pick because he does have upside, um, but I would have gone in a bit of a different direction. But I, listen, the, the Jazz are a hard team to read because, you know, they don't need bigs. You know, they've got guys like Trey Lyles and Rudy Gobert and Derek Favors. You know, they're loaded at those positions. You know, they don't really need wings, you know, unless Gordon Hayward goes somewhere else. You know, but, again, uh, this is going to be one of those drafts, I think, where we're going to really have to wait until free agency to really understand where uh, these teams are going to be going. But it, I don't hate the pick, but th it's not the direction I would have taken. Yeah, the only reason why I say that, because I would actually go with Semi Ojale. But I just we don't know what Gordon Hayward's gonna do. We really don't. And do you want to take a chance on a guy that you know is a tweener, a bit of a Derrick Williams kind of player? Um, I just think for me, because I also like Jawan Evans, but he's a really small point guard. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, I, I just, I just seen enough of Edmund Sumner to believe that he could contribute to a playoff caliber team. So that's why I went with Edmund Sumner. Okay. All right. And it'll be I an interesting that. situation for the Jazz because you guys have mentioned they have plenty of depth on that team. You know, they did, you know, have issues with point guard. I think Exum will take a step. So they could take a risk at this spot. I wouldn't even be surprised if they stash somebody, you know, one of the international players that might not come over for a year or two because this roster does have young talent that's going to get better. And they could be active in free agency, like you mentioned, though. A lot depends on Gordon Hayward and what happens with that and George Hill. Yeah. But on to number 25, the Orlando Magic. Who are they taking, Mike? Uh, I I love this player as much you know probably as much as anybody else does, um, and I think he fits perfectly. I think they need a little bit more depth up front, um, so I'm going to take a guy who's tenacious on the boards and tenacious on offense, and I'm going to take Jonathan Motley. And I, again, a big, big, long player who can provide some immediate depth. Can you know can score with his back to the basket, can face you up and drive the lane. I love this kid as a scorer. I think he can make an impact right away. Um, the question is, is will is he strong enough and is he willing enough to play solid defense? That's remained to be seen. But again, at 25, if you're able to get a good impact scorer off your bench in Jonathan Motley, then the value is already there. I, I love this pick. What about you, Xavier? What do you think about this pick? That's a very good pick. You know, at 25, you know, this is the part where you're trying to find contributors. And he's a pro... His, he has pro-ready NBA skills. You know, he can rebound when he wants to, and he has some skills. So for a team like Orlando who just needs talent up front and just needs – they need guys who can really score, really, and he can score. So I'm not – I'm not – I like the pick. That's a very solid pick for a team that doesn't really have a – really have an identity, you know, yeah, they, that, anyway. that Orlando team just – it's still in the rebuild situation. You know, they're not going to make the playoffs. It's kind of a weird situation because they almost started a second rebuild when they picked up Frank Vogel because now they're looking for different players for Vogel-type players. So 
Right, right, right. And, I, and I'll tell you this too. I mean, I, and Xavier and, and you too, Nick, I mean, you, you guys probably both remember this. You guys both watched the NCAA tournament. You know, I mean, there were points in the NCAA tournament where Jonathan Motley was just unguardable. Yeah, uh, he, just, he was a matchup nightmare. Nobody could even keep up with his physicality. So, uh, again, at 25, I, I love this pick here. I think, I think what really hurts him was the game against South Carolina where – because I was there. I, I watched the game against South Carolina where he just pretty much just looked disinterested in playing. You know, I think that really hurt him because God, right. Scott's wanted to kind of see, you know, fight till the end and whatnot, but he really – Looked this interesting and just knew that he was going to the NBA after that. So that's I think that's what kind of hurts him a little bit. But I like him from a solid standpoint. You know, this is a guy that was pretty much dominant in the Big 12, you know. So I, I like the pick for the Orlando Magic. I really do. Moving on to number 26, Portland's got another pick. Who do you have him grabbing, Xavier? The theme of getting help in the front court, I'm going with Dwayne Bacon out of Florida State. Oh, Six. he took my pick. But I'm I'm so sorry, Mike. I, I apologize, Mike. I apologize, but you know, I just think that he has the potential. He has lottery type talent, you know, from a scoring standpoint. Question is his defense, but they need guys who can alleviate the pressure from CJ McCollum and Damian Lillard. They need guys that can get their own shot and create their own offense, so that those two don't have to do all the work for them. I just think from a defense standpoint, he still has to work. But I just think from an offensive standpoint, he just fits too well with this team, not for them to Mike, what do you think about this pick? I, I love it. Again, I was I was hoping that he'd slide to your nets because that's who I was taking if he was there. Um, I, again, this is a guy that can just score it well. I mean, he's just a great scorer from all over the floor. And I agree with his point. You know, they need to get a couple more guys in that backcourt that can really light you up. Again, if this late in the first round, you know, deep in your bench, you know, kind of, you know, get on that uh, get on that train. Uh, Dwayne Bacon, the way that I, the way that I watched him uh, in college, I mean, he's atrocious on defense. He's atrocious. <laughs> but uh, he's, you know, he's but really bad. He, is, he is bad. It's just, but his scoring ability makes him a first round pick, in my opinion. So Dwayne Bacon, I think it's a perfect fit. And he's got good size. He can play both, I think, small forward and shooting guard if you need him to. All right, moving on to number 27. Nets got another pick. Who are they grabbing, Mike? Uh, this is my backup pick uh, here. And it, Nick, uh, let me ask you a question. You feeling a little risky? Yeah, I'm feeling risky. Let's go with Hamidou Diallo. Mm. Okay. So, so I, <laughs> the reason I'm going with this is because the upside is there. Again, this late in the draft, they're in such a state of rebuild that they could afford to gamble on two upside prospects. But this kid's a freak athlete. Freak athlete. He's extremely raw. One of the more raw players in the entire draft. Didn't get a lot of playing time um, in college. But, again, I like the fit could, again, alleviate some pressure from a guy like Karis LeVert, who played very well last year. Rondé Hollis Jefferson is more of a strict defensive guy, more of like a Michael Kidd-Gilchrist type player. Um, I I like this pick here just because it, the upside is there. And, you know, you never know what you're going to get out of him, but he was a high-ranked recruit. So, again, going that same route that you were going with Harry Giles, that I think the Nets get two really good picks here. Yeah, no, I think the Nets, like you mentioned, will be swinging those home runs. They do have a great player development staff. Most people don't know that. Kenny Atkinson is known around the league for developing players. He had a big part of Jeremy Lin during Lin's sanity. He was on that Knicks staff. So I'm excited what they can do with developing these young guys. And they're going to have to take a risk when they messed up with all that those picks with the Celtics trade. So, Xavier, what do you think about this pick here? If it was any other team, I would say it's a terrible pick. You can't go off a guy that we ain't never even seen. But because it's your Brooklyn Nets and they done messed up because of Billy King's trade off all their draft picks, I like it. They need to take all the chances and they listen, they could they could go draft a kid out of high school for all I care. They just need to get talent anywhere they can find it. And I'm okay with that pick because Hamadou Diallo is a freak athlete, like Mike said. He has the potential to be a defensive stopper. And also he doesn't need the ball in his hands to be effective. Because he could play off the ball all day long. So I like I really like this pick for the Nets. All right, moving on to number 28. Los Angeles Lakers have another pick late in this draft. Who are they grabbing? Oh, man, it's, it's, it's a coin flip. You know, I got two guys. One is a defensive guy. One's an offensive guy. I think because of playing in the West, they go with the offensive guy, and I'm going with Alec Peters. Wow. I'm going with Alec Peters out of Valparaiso. 
you know, he is come. He he did get a little injured, but he's good. He's a solid player. He could kind of play like you know. Um, Luke Walton want to play how the Golden State Warriors play, and what is that? Pacing space with guys who can dribble, pass, and shoot. Alec Peters fits that mode. Um, my other backup choice before Mike could get too upset was PJ Dozier, only because he's a defensive guard that can actually get some stops. <laughs> But I think that they just can't resist going with – because they're going to try to go all in with offense because Lonzo Ball is their point guard. So I think they go with an offensive pick here. And I, and I like Alec Peters out of Valparaiso. Mike, your thoughts on this pick? Uh, you know, I don't love it. I, I don't hate it either. I mean, I think this is – if they were to go with a guy like Alec Peters here, I mean, he's got good skills. He's got a good game. Um, I don't like him as a first-round pick. But, you know, I didn't like Larry Nance as a first-round pick either. So, you know, well, I think this is a very similar pick to when they picked Larry Nance a couple of years ago. Um, but you know what? Listen, I, I don't hate it. He's a guy. He's a good, skilled player. They need some more help up front. So, you know, take a chance on a guy like Alec Peters. I honestly don't hate the pick. Question, would you prefer them taking P.J. Dozier, a defensive guard? Uh, on, honestly, at this point, I think their biggest need after they got Lonzo Ball would be center. I can't believe he's still on the board. I can't believe Jared Allen is still on the board. I, I honestly probably would have gone Jared Allen at this point, but uh, PJ Dozier to me is more of a yeah he stands at six foot six two hundred, so yeah. it, you know he's more of a guard you know slash forward type guy. I don't really think they need that. Um, yeah. So again, Alec Pe- you can take a chance on a guy like Alec Peters and it, it won't kill you, especially at twenty eight. Yeah, that's the only reason because Alec Peters is a skilled guard. I just think that once you get your point guard Alonzo Ball. I think that he needs to be surrounded with, by weapons. You need to put him around weapons. He's like a quarterback. You got to give him a whole bunch of wide receivers to him to throw the ball to. So I think Alec Pease will be a type of guy that he can create offense for, and he can hit, he'll knock down shots. He is a shooter. He's a knockdown shooter. So that's why I like Alec Peters here for the Lakers. So that's a solid pick right there for the Lakers. That's their second pick. All right, moving on to number 29 pick, the San Antonio Spurs. They need some help after last night's loss to the Warriors. Who do you have them grabbing, Mike? Jared Allen. This is not even a question. It's just, I mean, uh, Pau Gasol is getting older. You know, I, I don't see Dwayne Dedman as as an option there. You know, I think he's more of like a Bismack Biombo type uh, rim protector that you can bring off the bench. Uh, Jared Allen is a lottery talent, and I can't believe he fell this far down on the board. But, um, again, I don't see him as a huge high upside guy. But, again, with, with Greg Popovich, I mean, he could turn a not-so-high upside guy into into a superstar. So, you know, we'll see what he can go. I think he's a spitting image of Robin Lopez. But, again, I, I could see him possibly exceeding that in this system. I did not expect him to go this far. And it seems like the Spurs are always getting that player to drop to them. You know, somebody who has that talent and they get dropped in that Spurs system, they get even better than they thought they were going to be. Xavier, what do you think about this pick? Um, I like it. I have all my draft needs for the Spurs. I put they get whoever they want. <laughs> the Spurs are playing, they get whoever they want. Whoever they, whoever they get is going to turn to gold. So I completely trust the Spurs. I don't care who goes there. Whoever, they, whoever goes there will be perfectly fine. I'm not worried about that at all. And I think it just in general, they just need some young players too, some athleticism to kind of match up with the NBA with some of these slower guys they have. I think just getting a young big in there will help. Number 30, the final pick of our first round, the Utah Jazz are back up. Who are they grabbing? Uh, I'm going to go that they, the Utah Jazz will go with Tyler Lydon out of Syracuse. Um, a stretch four in the purest, in the purest form. He will not play any type of defense whatsoever. You're not drafting him for his defense. But what he can do, he has an NBA ready skill, and that's to shoot. And I think pairing him up with um, pairing him up with Rudy Gobert in the back in the front court. Also, you know, also they also have Trey Lyles, but Trey Lyles really hasn't been showing up. So I think they're gonna try to go with another stretch for to kind of give him some competition and play for minutes. So I think I like Tyler Light in here. He's the best player right now on the board at this particular junction. So I go with Tyler Tyler Lydon out of Syracuse. Quick fact about Tyler Lydon. He's actually from, I think, about two or three towns away from my hometown. So shout out to him. Hopefully he has a great NBA career. Mike, what do you think about this pick? I like it. I mean, again, when you're picking at 30, you're going with, you're going value. And, and again, you know, the Jazz are a team that are so deep uh, in so many ways. So, you know, 
getting another stretch four like Tyler Lydon. Again, I know Syracuse wasn't that good this year, but, you know, he can definitely stretch the floor. You're right. He doesn't play defense, but he can definitely score the basketball, has improved his game quite a bit. I also think he's got some pretty good upside. I think he's got starter caliber upside. Um, but, again, I, they could have gone in a bunch of different directions here. I mean, you could have yeah. prob- possibly seen Jordan Bell go right here. You could probably see Iconic Bogu. You could see, you know, maybe even a guy – like, uh, you know, maybe even an overseas guy. You look at, like, a guy like Anze Pasechniks. You know, I mean, a million different picks could have been made here, but I like the Tyler Lydon pick a lot. Yeah, and yeah. what we've heard about this draft is, you know, I think, Mike, you've said this before. I've heard other draft analysts say this before. After those, like, top seven picks, you know, there's a lot of question marks about who's yeah. going to go where, how these teams rank these players. So it could be a really interesting draft night. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. I'll, I'll tell you who I was really surprised didn't go. I'm really surprised Ivan Rab didn't get picked. Yeah, really surprised. Yeah. Stretch four, Chris Bosh type player. I, I mean, th- that kid's good. <laughs> I think uh, I think what a lot of teams are going to try to go with, you know, and this is a word I hate is potential. I hate the word potential. They want guys that that because Ivan Rab ceiling is more like a Tosh Gibson ceiling, a really good player. That's going to be on your team. That could be a spot starter, but wherever he goes, he's going to be productive. They want to go with guys that are going to be all stars. You know, and this is a draft where like the, like there's a lot of potential all stars in this draft. You know, from the Harry Giles, you even have a DJ Wilson from Michigan. You know, why wow, he didn't go neither. You know, so it, there's a lot of talent in this draft. You know, I don't think wherever these guys go, I don't think that you're going to be wrong because. Wherever they go, I think they're all going to – I think this is like one of those drafts where it's just like a lot of NBA-ready talent. So, you know, I think wherever guys go, I think they'll be successful, you know. There's some okay. picks that are just like – they'll be like, uh, does, he, does he really need to go? Even Thomas Bryant. Thomas Bryant didn't go off. He's a really good center, you know. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see this draft and see what happens. What? One more guy, and I, I know we got to end it up here, but one more guy that could go in the first round as well is Caleb Swanigan. I mean, it, yeah. and we didn't even touch on him, and he was unstoppable in college. Yeah. You know, and I know that his size really is is troubling, but the kid's got great skills, and he's just, you know, it, he's an effort guy. You know, so he's going to put, you know, another guy who's got a lot of skills and can put in a lot of effort. Again, I, I think bottom end of the first round, you could see a guy like that go as well. Yeah, like, yeah. I guess anyone can go anywhere, and I think it will never be a bad pick. I don't think there's going to be any bad picks in this draft, to be honest with you. Well, also in this draft, we could see plenty of movement, too. We've mentioned before Jimmy Butler, Paul George are possible names to be moved. There's always those guys under the radar that could be moved. And like we mentioned, the, <clears throat> the Nets and Celtics trade, that trade wasn't talked about until draft night. So that possible thing, we could see some salary dumps. We know there's been talk about you know a team like the Nets possibly taking on a big contract, one of these bad teams eating a contract for a pick. So don't be surprised if you see some movement that way. Just to run through our, our mock draft real quick, Number one, uh, Boston, Markel Foltz. Number two, Lakers, Lonzo Ball. Number three, Sixers, Josh Jackson. Number four, Suns, Jason Tatum. Number five, Kings, De'Aaron Fox. Number six, Magic, Malik Monk. Number seven, Jonathan Isaac. Number eight, New York Knicks, Dennis Smith. Number nine, Mavs, Frank Dakina. Number 10, Kings, Laurie Markin. Number 11, Charlotte Hornets, Justin Patton. Number 12, Pistons, Justin Jackson. Number 13, Terrence Ferguson for the Nuggets. Number 14, Heat, Zach Collins. Number 15, Blazers, John Collins. Number 16, Luke Kennard. Number 17, Bucks, Bam. Guys got to help me with this last name. Adebayo. Adebayo. Number 18, Indiana Pacers, TJ Leaf. Number 19, Atlanta Hawks, Donovan Mitchell. 20, Trailblazers, guys got to help me with this one again. OJ Anunobi. Anunobi. Another one right here. Number Another international guy. Number 21, OKC, Rondis. Rodion's Karuch. All right. Mike's got these names on the dot. He really does. <laughs> he really does. He really does. <laughs> I know that does take some practice for sure. Number 22, you guys have the Nets taking Harry Giles. Number 23, Raptors, Isaiah Hardstein. Number 24, Jazz. Edmund Summers, number five, Magic, Jonathan Motley, number 26, uh, Portland, Dwayne Bacon. Nets again at number 27. Mike, you got to do this one for me. (laughs) Hamid Diallo. 
Hamido Diallo, number 28, Los Angeles Lakers, Alec Peters, number 29, Spurs, Jared Allen, number 30, Ty, uh, Jazz, Tyler Luden. So that's our mock draft right here. You know, we possibly could throw out another mock draft before the draft start, the actual draft begins, but we'll see what happens. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter at OTG Basketball. Also hit that subscribe button. Mike, Xavier, great time today. Great work, guys. Appreciate the research you did to take this and make this happen. Awesome. Man, thank I you love so it. Much. Have fun. Have fun, man. All right, everybody, and thanks for listening, and have a great night.